A contract must be made with the free consent of the parties. But what do we mean by consent? And when it is said to be free? So, consent is nothing but we are uh, describing it as one of the very essentials of a valid contract. This is section 10 that is what says. Now, section 13 defines consent. Two or more parties are said to be consent when they agree upon the same thing in the same sense. That is important. There is something called as ad adam Cons uh, consent is also called as ad adam means identity of minds same thing sh should be understood in the same sense two or more parties are set to consent when they agree right agreeing upon the same thing in the same sense that is important so same thing in the same sense if i'm saying something you should be also understanding the same thing in the same way there should not be different interpretations. We are talking about contracts between people and people interpret different things in a different way. They have their own interpretations based on their different knowledges they possess. So that is why we are saying that is not how it should be. It should be all the parties to the contract should understand the terms and conditions, everything. They should be agreeing upon the same thing in the same sense. That is what is called as consent, right? Identity of minds or consensus added um, as we say now once we understand consent now when it is said to be free for a valid contract free consent is essential and consent is said to be free when it is not caused by okay remember consent is free when it is not caused by these five things what are these five things coercion undue influence fraud misrepresentation and mistake right remembering this thing is also uh, simple section 13 talks about consent 14 talks about free consent 15 coercion 16 17 18 19 20 that is how it continues coercion and new influence fraud misrepresentation and mistake so now let's understand let's try to understand what are these terms what do we mean by coercion and new influence fraud and misrepresentation and mistake as well so let's start with the coercion coercion under section 15 coercion is the committing or threatening to commit yes either you are committing it actively or even if you threaten to do that i will do this that is also coercion any act which is forbidden by indian penal code or unlawful detaining or threatening to detain yes detaining or threatening to detain both are there any property to the prejudice of any person whatever with the intention of causing any person to enter into an agreement that means all this definition means forcing somebody to enter into an agreement that is what it is like if i put a gun on your head and i ask you to sign an agreement that is coercion because i am threatening to kill you right the th threat or even showing a weapon towards you is some offense and again so somewhere if i'm putting a knife if i'm putting a gun at you if i'm putting somebody at stake if i'm trying to you know put any damage to your property i'm asking you to sign an agreement that is coercion so if it is caused by coercion the agreement is said to be what we will check into that but first let's understand what is what are the essentials what are the features of coercion so it is just nothing but the breakdown of this definition only which is given by section 15 so let's just try to understand coercion includes actual committing or threatening to commit any act right it includes physical compulsion uh, what we call it as uh, fair and also unlawful detaining or threatening to detain any property so it doesn't mean that physical compulsion only fear also there and unlawful detaining is also included or even if you're threatening to detain yeah, there is a, sp a space that should be there fear and unlawful detaining so everything is included then the act committed or threatened to commit it should be forbidden by indian for penal code so whatever indian penal code is forbidding has forbidden and if you are doing it or threatening to do so that act will be considered as coercion if you are forcing somebody to enter into ag into an agreement by doing all these things now there is a case law of ammi raju versus sheshamma what is this case law Husband gives a threat to commit suicide to his wife and son that if they fail to execute a release deed of their share in the property in favor of his brother. The wife and son executed a release in consequence of the threat. In this case, 
deed of a release was obtained by coercion as threat to commit suicide as an offense under ipc yes now one guy has been he tries to commit suicide he's threatening his wife and son to sign their property in favor of his brother like i am forcing my wife and son to force their property to uh, uh, what we call it as uh, to sign an agreement or to release their property in favor of my brother that is what is called as now here what happens i'm not threatening them i'm just threatening and like i'm not putting any harm to them but i'm threatening that i will commit a suicide and yes committing a suicide is also a crime it is an offense so that comes under uh this thing called coercion and this case law is popular amiraju versus seishama so you just need to remember this thing co the, the, these are these were the two conditions like the, for this one it's, it was an example now what happens coercion may proceed from any person that is even from a person who is not a party to the contract yes like if there is a coercion if you and me are into an agreement and there is a third person who puts a gun on your head and asks you to sign so that third person can also force coercion right that is also there so it can move from any person the act or threat which constitutes coercion may be directed against any person and not necessarily the other party to the contract yes that is also there if you and me are there i am putting a gun on somebody else on somebody some third person some random person walking on the street and i'm threatening you that if you don't sign this agreement i will kill this person now you feel for this person and you signed it so that i should not be killing it or even if i'm not doing that anybody like i have asked somebody to put a gun on th- some random person and we two are doing so again it can const- it can move from any person and it can move to any person that is not necessary that it should be party the contract right it does not matter whether the indian penal code is or is not in force where the coercion is employed now you cannot deny that you know indian penal code was not active there or it doesn't if it is there that something that is against the indian penal code whether indian penal code is actively enforced there or not that is a different story but when we are saying indian contract act it considers whatever is against whatever is included as an offense in indian penal code or ipc it is an offense and threatening to do so or doing so is something that will be part of your coercion the act must be done or threatened to be done with the intention of causing any person to enter into an agreement yes that is also important that is what we have been seeing right now what happens with the effect when the consent to an agreement is given because of coercion it is voidable at the option of party whose consent was so obtained that is i either contract can be performed or can be resigned by the party who gave consent because of coercion so now if i put down a head a gun on your head and asked you to sign the agreement you have signed it now later on since there was a coercion i forced you to sign the agreement you have signed the agreement now later on the agreement is voidable at your option not at my option at your option you can decide whether to continue with the agreement or to make it void so whether to make it valid or to make it void that option is with you because your consent was coerced to the agreement and now you are the aggrieved party you have that option so on your option the contract is voidable either it can be valid or it can be void also that is what happens with the coercion so coercion is doing something which is against the ipc or threatening to do so to get the consent right that is coercion now next it is undue influence what is undue influence section 16 subsection 1 defines a contract is said to be influenced by undue influence where the relations subsisting between the parties are such that one of the party is in a position to dominate the will of the other and uses that position to obtain an unfair advantage over the other so this is like you and me you trust me so much that whatever i say you will follow it blindly and now i ask you to do something which is in my favor i an unfair ad- advantage something like naturally if i'm getting an advantage that is something different but unfair advantage something i'm uh, something is which is not true and i'm asking you to believe it to be true that is undue influence so a contract is said to be influenced by undue influence where that there should be a subsisting relationship that is important without a relationship you cannot uh, influence anybody so there should be an influence like i should be having an influence upon you and i should be taking an undue advantage out of it that out of that influence that is what is mean by undue influence and make you enter to sign an agreement later on if you find out that i have taken an advantage now again you will have that option whether 
to keep it valid or void similar to coercion right so let's break down this definition let's try to understand what do we mean by undue influence one of the contracting parties is in a like the first point it says one of the important parties in a, is in a position to dominate the will and mind of the another that is to affect belief and action of the other that means one party should have an influence over the other right i am in a position to dominate your will whatever i say you believe it you have i have certain influence on you the dominating party takes unfair advantage of his position over the weaker party now if i am in a position to influence you i am taking an unfair advantage out of that position that is also important unfair advantage must spring from the use of that dominant position yes that unfair advantage is not coming naturally but it is coming because of the position that i hold between our relationship doctrine of undue influence does not protect the person who deliberately and voluntarily agree to the terms out of their own mistake or impetus or lack of foresight now what it is doctrine of undue influence this undue influence is saying that you know i am influencing you but it does not protect the person who deliberately and voluntarily agree to the terms out of their own mistake like i am not saying anything to you i am not influencing you but you are believing it by your own you are saying whatever you are saying and later on you cannot blame me that i have influenced if something i am not saying it if it is because of your imprudence or lack of future f- foresight that's your mistake you cannot blame on me that is what this doctrine it does not protect the person who is doing something deliberately or voluntarily by himself and putting the blame later on on this undue influence so that cannot be said right that is what it is trying to say <laughs> now when an undue influence is supposed to work there are certain conditions certain presumptions of the existence of undue influence section 16 subsection 2 talks about these things like this is the situation only where undue influence can be exercise so first it says where he holds real or apparent authority or over the other party to contract so the person who we are saying will influence and take undue in- advantage of that influence should hold real or apparent authority if there is no authority no now there are examples relationship between master and servant public officer and accused so master always has an upper hand so there should be a, a, a authority right if there is an authority then there is a possibility next one says when one party stands in a fiduciary relationship to the other party to contract every relation of trust and confidence is fiduciary relation so what we are saying if there is a fiduciary relationship and what is this fiduciary relation fiduciary relation is every relation of trust and confidence where like a doctor and patient patient always trust the doctor blindly that is what we are trying to say teacher and student student trust teacher blindly so if that kind of relation is there there is also a possibility of undue influence when on uh, point number 3 when he makes a contract with a person whose mental capacity is temporarily or permanently affected by reason of age illness or mental or bodily distress somebody who is ill like maybe because of illness or it can be mental distress or so or physical distress or sometimes because of age also somebody who is dependent on the other person now this other person has always an inf- influence like if i let's suppose you are ill right you are mentally ill now you i am the one taking care of you but you have a lot of property so whatever i tell you believe it to be true no so in this case of course i can take an ad- undue advantage out of this position so this is also scenario for undue influence <laughs> now consequence we haven't mentioned again consequence for undue influence is again similar to coercion that the contract will stand voidable at the option of the aggrieved party so if i'm taking an undue advantage out of you and unfair or what god has undue influence out of you you will decide whether to make it valid or void it's up to the aggrieved party next it is fraud fraud section 17 now fraud is very common but let's try to understand what do we mean by fraud the term fraud means a false statement of a fact made intentionally with a view to deceive the other party two things false statement made intentionally and de- intention to deceive the other party i'm telling you a lie by knowing it if i genuinely believe it to be true then true then it's a different story but if i'm telling you something which i know is not true and why am i telling you because i am going to get some benefit out of you or 
you are going to get some loss out of it if i'm going to get a benefit out of you and telling you something that would be somewhere if you believe it then maybe undue influence we would count but fraud is something deceive intention to deceive is the key over here so section 17 of the in indian contract act defines fraud means and includes any of the following acts committed by a party to a contract or with his convenience or by his agent again that is important by his convenience or by his agent which intend to deceive another party there to or his agent or to induce him to enter into the contract now let's break down this definition as well the suggestion as a fact it in uh, following uh, what are those acts ha huh. it means and it includes okay so what are those acts let's look at the suggestion as a fact of that which is not true by one who does not believe it to be true so i'm suggesting you something which is not true which i know it is not true but i'm saying that it is true right so that is their suggestion as a fact of that which is not true by one who does not believe it to be true active concealment of a fact by one leaving knowledge or belief of the fact again something which you don't know but that is important for you to know if i'm telling you a lie that's a different story but even if without telling a lie if i'm not telling you something which you should be knowing i'm actively concealing i'm trying to hide some information from you that is also fraud a promise made without any intention of performing it i'm just making it promise like i will do this but i never intend to do this that is also fraud any other act, now you will say that uh, you know if i'm making a promise then we uh, i'm making a promise without intention of performing it then there is no intention to create any legal relationship how would you have we are not talking about this promise to be an agreement this because of this promise i'm making you to sign another agreement so we are talking about this agreement which you have signed and because of this promise i have made which i never intend to perform so that promise is also considered as one of the acts of fraud any other act fitted to deceive what anything to deceive to harm to you know put you in harm put you in danger or to get some benefit to give some distress to you that will all be included in fraud any such act or omission as the law specifically declares to be fraudulent if something is there which law specifically de defines or declares that this is fraud that will also be included in fraud now the let's breaking uh, these are the acts but breaking down this definition what do we understand by fraud there must be false representation or assertion of a fact yes false representation or assertion or like if i'm saying some something as negative or something negative that is already being told and i'm just accept consenting to it in uh, between you and me that is also fraud the representation should be of a material fact something that is important to the contract something that is important to the agreement that is also we are uh, th that is the thing that we are talking uh, as false right the fact material fact material means important if it is not important then we can ignore it it must be made with the knowledge of its falsely uh, or without belief in its truth or recklessly not uh, caring whether it is true or false so it is like it must be made with the knowledge of its falsity or without belief in its truth or recklessly not caring whether it is true or false like knowing it that you know this is not true but still i am telling that this is true so false false uh, something that you know recklessly i am saying not caring not bothering all those things uh, whether it is true or false i'm just saying i'm like okay this is not so important but it is important that is there it must be made with the intention to induce yes other party to act upon it that is there the um, like whatever i'm trying trying to say i'm saying because i want you to do something i want to act upon that information right the other party must have been induced to act upon the representation and must be deceived like if i'm saying all these things and at the end you didn't sign the agreement then there is no purpose you cannot say that i have done a fraud because you didn't get any i tried to make a fool out of you i tried to do a fraud with you but you were quite successful in not indulging or not getting trapped into it so that that will not be there so it must be deceived that is there some like trying to deceive is not a crime only if you get deceived then we will include it in you know as an offense or we will call it as fraud party acting on representation or assertion must subsequently suffer some loss due to you that's yes after entering the contract there should be some loss also otherwise why would you complain about it right that is there 
now there is one more uh, small concept like mere silence is not fraud the general rule says that if silence does amount to fraud but in certain situations silence does not amount to fraud now what is the actual scenario so the general rule is that si mere silence is not fraud even though if it conceals those facts which if disclosed the other party would perhaps have not entered into a contract so we are saying that if you are just silent concealment is different being silent is different concealment means i'm hiding from you but silent means i'm not telling i'm not saying anything i'm just like uh, not at all i'm not having any opinion or anything i'm not at all saying anything so concealment is even if you are asking i'm not telling you but silence is you haven't asked i didn't tell you that is what we should say silence so general rule is that just silence does not amount to fraud if i'm silent on something I, it it doesn't mean i'm doing a fraud but a party to a contract need not give entire information to the other party however there are exceptions to general rule so this general rule is that if i'm silent on something it doesn't mean i have done a fraud with you but there are certain scenarios in which silence would amount to fraud now what are these scenarios number 1 silence is fraudulent if the circumstances of the case are such that it is the duty of the person to speak for example in insurance contracts a person taking policy has the duty to declare all the correct facts so this is a scenario where it is my duty to tell you everything if i'm not telling you everything if i'm silent on something that will amount to fraud like in case of insurance contracts that is the example then ne next it is silence is sometimes equivalent to speech yes therefore where a person knows his silence is going to be deceptive and still keeps quiet he is guilty of fraud yes sometimes being silent means you have said something like if you're not saying something we would consider it as no and you understand that being silent would harm somebody it is going to be deceptive and still you are quiet that is that means also means you are being guilty of fraud now next point says sometimes a statement may be true when made but due to change in circumstances it may become false subsequently yes something is true at the time but after some time after some circumstances has changed and the same statement which was true now it's false so now it's my duty to communicate this change that this earlier statement which was true now it is not true so you should be knowing it so it is the duty of the person to communicate change circumstances and in this in this case if the communication is not made if the communication is silent then it will amount to fraud right now next is misrepresentation according to section 18 following acts constitute misrepresentation what are those misrepresentation number 1 unwarranted positive statement what is this in this case a person makes a statement on the basis of information from untrustworthy sources however he innocently believes the fact represented to be true and such fact is material to the contract now what is there is a difference between fraud and misrepresentation fraud was actively saying something knowing that it is not true but still telling that it is true but here in misrepresentation a person makes a statement on the basis of information from untrustworthy sources like some source is there which is not trustworthy and from there i got some information and i am telling you but i don't know whether it is true or not i believe it to be true whether it is false that is a different story but what am i telling is false but i believe it to be true so that is misrepresentation right he i know he, here he, we are saying that the person believes the fact represented to be true and such fact is material to the contract if if i know that it is not true and still i am telling you then it will amount to fraud but if i don't know uh, like if i believe it to be true and still i am telling you that it is true and it happens to be false and it is material to the contract if known that it was false you would have not entered but you have entered since i'm telling you it is true but i also believe it to be true that is what is called as misrepresentation and we call it as unwarranted positive statement then next it is breach of duty what is breach of duty misrepresentation includes breach of duty committed without intention to deceive by which the person constituting the person constituting it gains an advantage to the prejudice of another that is other party suffers loss because of breach of duty by one party so breach of duty means you were supposed to perform something it was your duty to do something and you are not doing it right you have breached it and now because of your breach i am in a loss okay i have suffered some loss now this lo suffering of loss for me 
like you didn't know about this you it's just for you it was just your duty which you didn't do but because of the duty being not done i am suffering a loss so this would again be constituted as misrepresentation because you are not aware of it if you are aware of it and still you're doing you know that if you don't do this i will have a loss then it will be something different but without knowing that you're just doing it but still there is some loss so that is misrepresentation next it is causing innocently a party to make a mistake if a party causes another party to an agreement to make a mistake as to the substance of a thing which is subject of the agreement it is called as a misrepresentation so if i'm causing like if i'm party causes another party to an agreement to make a mistake as to substance of a thing if some some mistake we are committing which is subject of an agreement it is also called as misrepresentation that is there right contract entered into because of coercion now this is a condition coercion and even influence fraud or misrepresentation is voidable at the option of the party whose consent was so obtained this is the scenario for coercion and even influence misrepresentation and fraud now next what we have is mistake mistake is a bigger thing here we understood about something called as mistake if somebody is causing mistake to an agreement mistake as to the substance of a thing which is you know a subject matter to the agreement that will relate to misrepresentation but what is this mistake that we are talking about so mistake may be yeah it is written as ev but it is maybe mistake may be defined as erroneous belief about something element of mistake affects the validity of a contract now there are two types of mistakes here we can see this chart mistake of fact and mistake of law now mistake of law is about two types of law mistake of indian law and mistake of foreign law and mistake mistake of fact is also of two things mistake as to existence of subject matter and mistakes as regards to identity of subject matter so let's try to understand what are these mistakes but mistake may be defined as error some kind of error some kind of problem right that is mistake so mistake is not that complicated as section 20 and 21 section 20 mistake of fact right the first one is mistake of fact so there are two types two kinds of mistakes when both the parties to an agreement are under a mistake as to a material fact some kind of material important fact to an agreement the agreement is said to be void see so far the for the other things it is voidable but in case of mistake it is void if we are not in the understanding of the fact of the agreement then how can we say the agreement is valid it will stand void conditions as to mistake of fact are both the parties to the contract must be under a mistake at the time of formation of a contract right initial mistake it should be if mistake is committed by any other party then contract is not void if it is by one party only then the other party was well aware so it should be by the both the parties the mistake should be of fact and not of law yes if it is mistake of law the provisions would be different so make sure that it is mistake of fact and mistake should be essential to an agreement if it is not essential if it is not important then again we will not consider it so it should be important it should be of fact and it should be of both the parties case law courtier versus hasty c agrees to sell h a specific cargo of goods supposed to be on its way from england to bombay it turns out that before the day of bargain the ship carrying the cargo was damaged and the goods were lost neither party has aware, was aware of it the agreement is void now you and me entered into an agreement that i will be sending this cargo from england to bombay now the it has like before the day of bargain before the final the sh ship was coming and on the way it is damaged now you don't know about this i don't know both are, both the parties are are unaware are of the mistake of the fact and yes it is an important fact to the agreement so and it is not about law it is about the subject matter so then it will become mistake of fact right that is this case law simple not so complicated mistake of fact is of two types one is mistake as to existence of subject matter when both the parties believe in existence of certain state of things which in reality is not i guess the contract is said to be void so the subject matter itself does not exist like you know i entered in a contract with you i entered into an agreement with you that i will sell my house to you which is located in mumbai and we are doing this agreement in pune now what happened day after tomorrow we scheduled 
and uh, shed scheduled a negotiation and we were finally about to decide now what happens before the final negotiation there is an earthquake and this house is destroyed you don't know about it i don't know it about it we still entered into an agreement now this subject matter does not exist itself of which we are talking about i'm selling you a house which does not exist so if something that doesn't exist now see if i know about this information and i'm still entering then it will be for uh, fraud because i am actively concealing to uh, that this information to you but i am also equally innocent that i also didn't know about this information then it will be mistake as to existence of subject matter and second one it says mistake as to identity of the um, subject matter it usually arises when one party intends to deal in one thing and the other party in other things like the same example of ship we can say right we entered into an agreement to deliver uh, for a cargo to deliver at your place from uh, england to mumbai but when the cargo finally comes i think thought of some other cargo and you thought of some other cargo now you are not interested in the cargo which you got so that was a mistake as to the identity of the subject matter you understood something both we both are in mistake because i'm thinking something different you are thinking something different that does not lead to identity of mind itself right that is something called as like we are not agreeing upon the same thing that that means the consent is not free but it is because of mistake so it if it is because of mistake of subject matter then it will be void now again one a case law is there raffles versus which this w agreed to buy f, uh, to buy from r cargo of cotton to arrive on ex, uh, what is what do you call as expertless uh, sorry expertless ship from bombay where uh, there were two ships of this same name sailing from bombay and each party had different ship in their mind the same example i think i gave you right so that is uh, like we are in the mistake of the identity you are thinking of some other ship i'm thinking of some other ship next one mistake of law this was mistake of fact now when it comes to mistake of law there are two types of mistakes mistakes of like there are two types of law mistake of indian law and mistake of foreign law so if it is it is well settled rule that ignorance of law is no excuse a mistake of law force in india is therefore no excuse and contract cannot be avoided if you know if you're saying that i was not aware of this uh, law being force in india that is not an option the contract will be very much valid so contract cannot be avoided on the ground of mistake of indian law that is there law of land is supposed to be known ignorance of law is not an excuse but mistake of foreign law will be treated as mistake of fact mistake of foreign law is treated as mistake of fact that is contract is void if both the parties are under mistake as to foreign law and one cannot be expected to know the law of the other country that is also simple like we are in india if it is a mistake as to indian law then you are supposed to know you cannot say that but if it is about some foreign law we cannot say that you are supposed to know a foreign law also right so we are talking about law of land so mistake of land mistake of foreign law is not your problem right this is all about free consent